The Platner Story by H. G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Platner Story by H. G. Wells. Whether the story of Gottfried Plattner is to be credited or not is a pretty question in the value of evidence. On the one hand, we have seven witnesses. To be perfectly exact, we have six and a half pairs of eyes, and one undeniable fact. And on the other, we have, what is it, prejudice, common sense, the inertia of opinion? Never were there seven more honest-seeming witnesses. Never was there a more undeniable fact than the inversion of Gottfried Plattner's anatomical structure, and never was there a more preposterous story than the one they have to tell. The most preposterous part of the story is the worthy Gottfried's contribution, for I count him as one of the seven. Heaven forbid that I should be led into giving countenance to superstition by a passion for impartiality, and so come to share the fate of Usapia's patrons. Frankly, I believe there is something crooked about this business of Gottfried Plattner, but what that crooked factor is, I will admit as frankly, I do not know. I have been surprised at the credit accorded to the story in the most unexpected and authoritative quarters. The fairest way to the reader, however, will be for me to tell it without further comment. Gottfried Plattner is, in spite of his name, a free-born Englishman. His father was an Alsatian who came to England in the sixties, married a respectable English girl of unexceptional antecedents, and died, after a wholesome and uneventful life, devoted, I understand, chiefly to the laying of parquet flooring, in 1887. Godfrey's age is seven and twenty. He is, by virtue of his heritage of three languages, modern languages master in a small private school in the south of England. To the casual observer he is singularly like any other modern languages master in any other small private school. His costume is neither very costly nor very fashionable, but, on the other hand, it is not markedly cheap or shabby. His complexion, like his height and his bearing, is inconspicuous. You would not notice, perhaps, that, like the majority of people, his face was not absolutely symmetrical, his right eye a little larger than the left, and his jaw a trifle heavier on the right side. If you, as an ordinary careless person, were to bear his chest and feel his heart beating, you would probably find it quite like the heart of anyone else. But here you and the trained observer would part company. If you found his heart quite ordinary, the trained observer would find it quite otherwise. And once the thing was pointed out to you, you too would perceive the peculiarity easily enough. It is that Gottfried's heart beats on the right side of his body. Now. That is not the only singularity of Gottfried's structure, although it is the only one that would appeal to the untrained mind. Careful sounding of Gottfried's internal arrangements by a well-known surgeon seems to point to the fact that all the other unsymmetrical parts of his body are similarly misplaced. The right lobe of his liver is on the left side, the left on his right, while his lungs, too, are similarly contraposed. What is still more singular, unless Gottfried is a consummate actor, we must believe that his right hand has recently become his left. Since the occurrences we are about to consider, as impartially as possible, he has found the utmost difficulty in writing, except from right to left across the paper with his left hand. He cannot throw with his right hand. He is perplexed at mealtimes between knife and fork, and his ideas of the rule of the road, he is a cyclist, are still a dangerous confusion and there is not a scrap of evidence to show that before these occurrences Gottfried was at all left-handed. There is yet another wonderful fact in this preposterous business. Gottfried produces three photographs of himself. You have him at the age of five or six, thrusting fat legs at you from under a plaid frock and scowling. In that photograph his left eye is a little larger than his right, and his jaw is a trifle heavier on the left side. This is the reverse of his present living condition. The photograph of Gottfried at fourteen seems to contradict these facts, but that is because it is one of those cheap gem photographs that were then in vogue, taken direct upon the metal, and therefore reversing things just as a looking-glass would. The third photograph represents him at one and twenty, and confirms the record of the others. There seems here evidence of the strongest confirmatory character that Gottfried has exchanged his left side for his right. Yet 
how a human being can be so changed, short of a fantastic and pointless miracle, it is exceedingly hard to suggest. In one way, of course, these facts might be explicable on the supposition that Plattner has undertaken an elaborate mystification on the strength of his heart's displacement. Photographs may be faked and left-handedness imitated, but the character of the man does not lend itself to any such theory. He is quiet, practical, unobtrusive, and thoroughly sane from the Nordau standpoint. He likes beer and smokes moderately, takes walking exercise daily, and has a healthy high estimate of the value of his teaching. He has a good but untrained tenor voice, and takes a pleasure in singing airs of a popular and cheerful character. He is fond, but not morbidly fond, of reading, chiefly fiction pervaded with a vaguely pious optimism, sleeps well, and rarely dreams. He is, in fact, the very last person to evolve a fantastic fable. Indeed, so far from forcing this story upon the world, he has been singularly reticent on the matter. He meets inquirers with a certain engaging bashfulness, is almost the word, that disarms the most suspicious. He seems genuinely ashamed that anything so unusual has occurred to him. It is to be regretted that Plattner's aversion to the idea of post-mortem dissection may postpone, perhaps forever, the positive proof that his entire body has had its left and right sides transposed. Upon that fact mainly the credibility of his story hangs. There is no way of taking a man and moving him about in space as ordinary people understand space that will result in our changing his sides. Whatever you do, his right is still his right, and his left his left. You can do that with a perfectly thin and flat thing, of course. If you were to cut a figure out of paper, any figure with a right and left side, you could change its side simply by lifting it up and turning it over. But with a solid it is different. Mathematical theorists tell us that the only way in which the right and left sides of a solid body can be changed is by taking that body clean out of space as we know it taking it out of ordinary existence, that is, and turning it somewhere outside space. This is a little abstruse, no doubt, but anyone with any knowledge of mathematical theory will assure the reader of its truth. To put the thing in technical language, the curious inversion of Plattner's right and left sides is proof that he has moved out of our space into what is called the fourth dimension, and that he has returned again to our world. Unless we choose to consider ourselves the victims of an elaborate and motiveless fabrication, we are almost bound to believe that this has occurred. So much for the tangible facts. Now we come to the account of the phenomena that attended his temporary disappearance from the world. It appears that in the Sussexville Proprietary School Plattner not only discharged the duties of modern language master, but also taught chemistry, commercial geography, bookkeeping, shorthand, drawing, and any other additional subject to which the changing fancies of the boy's parents might direct attention. He knew little or nothing of these various subjects, but in secondary, as distinguished from board or elementary schools, knowledge in the teacher is very properly by no means so necessary as high moral character and gentlemanly tone. In chemistry he was particularly deficient, knowing he says nothing beyond the three gases, whatever the three gases may be. As, however, his pupils began by knowing nothing, and derived all their information from him, this caused him, or anyone, but little inconvenience for several terms. Then a little boy named Wibble joined the school, who had been educated, it seems, by some mischievous relative into an inquiring habit of mind. This little boy followed Plattner's lessons with marked and sustained interest, and in order to exhibit his zeal on the subject brought at various times substances for Plattner to analyze. Plattner, flattered by this evidence of his power of awakening interest, and trusting to the boy's ignorance, analyzed these, and even made general statements as to their composition. Indeed, he was so far stimulated by his pupil as to obtain a work upon analytical chemistry, and study it during his supervision of the evening's preparation. He was surprised to find chemistry quite an interesting subject. So far the story is absolutely commonplace, but now the greenish powder comes upon the scene. The source of that greenish powder seems unfortunately lost. Master Wibble tells a torturous story of finding it done up in a packet in a disused lime-kiln near the Downs. It would have been an excellent thing for Plattner and possibly for Master Wibble's family if a match could have been applied to that powder there and then. The young gentleman certainly did not bring it to school in a packet, but in a common eight-ounce graduated medicine bottle plugged with masticated newspaper. 
He gave it to Plattner at the end of the afternoon school. Four boys had been detained after school prayers in order to complete some neglected tasks, and Plattner was supervising these in the small classroom in which the chemical teaching was conducted. The appliances for the practical teaching of chemistry in the Sussexville Proprietary School, as in most small schools in this country, are characterized by a severe simplicity. They are kept in a small cupboard standing in a recess and having about the same capacity as a common traveling trunk. Plattner, being bored with his passive superintendent, seemed to have welcomed the intervention of Wibble with his green powder as an agreeable diversion, and, unlocking this cupboard, proceeded at once with his analytical experiments. Wibble sat, luckily for himself, at a safe distance regarding him. The four malefactors, feigning a profound absorption in their work, watched him furtively with the keenest interest for even within the limits of the three gases Plattner's practical chemistry was, I understand, temerious. They are practically unanimous in their account of Plattner's proceedings. He poured a little of the green powder into a test tube and tried the substance with water, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid in succession. Getting no result, he emptied out a little heap, nearly half the bottle full, in fact, upon a slate and tried a match. He held the medicine bottle in his left hand. The stuff began to smoke and melt, and then exploded with deafening violence and a blinding flash. The five boys, seeing the flash and being prepared for catastrophes, ducked below their desks, and were none of them seriously hurt. The window was blown out into the playground, and the blackboard on its easel was upset. The slate was smashed to atoms. Some plaster fell from the ceiling but no other damage was done to the school edifice or appliances, and the boys at first, seeing nothing of Plattner, fancied he was knocked down and lying out of their sight below the desks. They jumped out of their places to go to his assistance and were amazed to find the space empty. Being still confused by the sudden violence of the report, they hurried to the open door under the impression that he must have been hurt and have rushed out of the room. But Carson, the foremost, nearly collided in the doorway with the principal, Mr. Lidgett. Mr. Lidgett is a corpulent, excitable man with one eye. The boys describe him as stumbling into the room, mouthing some of those tempered expletives irritable schoolmasters accustom themselves to use, lest worse befall. Wretched mum-chancer, he said. Where's Mr. Plattner? The boys are agreed on the very words. Wobbler, sniveling puppy, and mum-chancer are, it seems, among the ordinary small change of Mr. Lidgett's scholastic commerce. Where's Mr. Plattner? That was a question that was to be repeated many times in the next few days. It really seemed as though that frantic hyperbole, blown to atoms, had for once realized itself. There was not a visible particle of Plattner to be seen, not a drop of blood nor a stitch of clothing to be found. Apparently he had been blown clean out of existence and left not a rack behind. Not so much as would cover a sixpenny piece, to quote a proverbial expression. The evidence of his absolute disappearance as a consequence of that explosion is indubitable. It is not necessary to enlarge here upon the commotion excited in the Sussexville Proprietary School, and in Sussexville and elsewhere, by this event. It is quite possible indeed that some of the readers of these pages may recall the hearing of some remote and dying version of that excitement during the last summer holidays. Lidgett, it would seem, did everything in his power to suppress and minimize the story. He instituted a penalty of twenty-five lines for any mention of Plattner's name among the boys, and stated in the schoolroom that he was clearly aware of his assistant's whereabouts. He was afraid, he explains, that the possibility of an explosion happening, in spite of the elaborate precautions taken to minimize the practical teaching of chemistry, might injure the reputation of the school, and so might any mysterious quality in Plattner's departure. Indeed, he did everything in his power to make the occurrence seem as ordinary as possible. In particular, he cross-examined the five eyewitnesses of the occurrence so searchingly that they began to doubt the plain evidence of their senses. But in spite of these efforts, the tale, in a magnified and distorted state, made a nine days' wonder in the district, and several parents withdrew their sons on colorable pretexts. Not the least remarkable point in the matter is the fact that a large number of people in the neighborhood dreamed singularly vivid dreams of Plattner during the period of excitement before his return, and that these dreams had a curious uniformity. In almost all of them Plattner was seen, sometimes singly, sometimes in company, wandering about through a coruscating iridescence. 
In all cases his face was pale and distressed, and in some he gesticulated toward the dreamer. One or two of the boys, evidently under the influence of nightmare, fancied that Plattner approached them with remarkable swiftness, and seemed to look closely into their very eyes. Others fled with Plattner from the pursuit of vague and extraordinary creatures of a globular shape. But all these fancies were forgotten in inquiries and speculations when on the Wednesday next, but one after the Monday of the explosion, Plattner returned. The circumstances of his return were as singular as those of his departure. So far as Mr. Lidgett's somewhat choleric outline can be filled in from Plattner's hesitating statements, it would appear that on Wednesday evening, toward the hour of sunset, the former gentleman, having dismissed evening preparation, was engaged in his garden, picking and eating strawberries, a fruit of which he is inordinately fond. It is a large, old-fashioned garden, secured from observation, fortunately, by a high and ivy-covered red-brick wall. Just as he was stooping over a particularly prolific plant, there was a flash in the air and a heavy thud, and before he could look round, some heavy body struck him violently from behind. He was pitched forward, crushing the strawberries he held in his hand, and that so roughly that his silk hat, Mr. Lidgett adheres to the older ideas of scholastic costume, was driven violently down upon his forehead, and almost over one eye. This heavy missile, which slid over him sideways and collapsed into a sitting posture among the strawberry plants, proved to be our long-lost Mr. Gottfried Plattner. In an extremely disheveled condition, he was collarless and hatless, his linen was dirty and there was blood upon his hands. Mr. Lidgett was so indignant and surprised that he remained on all fours, and with his hat jammed down on his eye, while he expostulated vehemently with Plattner for his disrespectful and unaccountable conduct. This scarcely idyllic scene completes what I may call the exterior version of the Plattner story, its esoteric aspect. It is quite unnecessary to enter here into all the details of his dismissal by Mr. Lidgett. Such details, with the full names and dates and references, will be found in the larger report of these occurrences that was laid before the Society for the Investigation of Abnormal Phenomena. The singular transposition of Plattner's right and left sides was scarcely observed for the first day or so, and then first in connection with his disposition to right from right to left across the blackboard. He concealed rather than extended this curious confirmatory circumstance, as he considered it would unfavorably affect his prospects in a new situation. The displacement of his heart was discovered some months after, when he was having a tooth extracted under anesthetics. He then very unwillingly allowed a cursory surgical examination to be made of himself, with a view to a brief account in the Journal of Anatomy. That exhausts the statement of the material facts, and we may now go on to consider Plattner's account of the matter. But first, let us clearly differentiate between the preceding portion of this story and what is to follow. All I have told thus far is established by such evidence as even a criminal lawyer would approve. Every one of the witnesses is still alive. The reader, if he have the leisure, may hunt the lads out tomorrow or even brave the terrors of the redoubtable Lidgett and cross-examine and trap and test to his heart's content Gottfried Plattner himself, and his twisted heart and his three photographs are producible. It may be taken as proved that he did disappear for nine days as the consequence of an explosion, that he returned almost as violently, under circumstances in their nature annoying to Mr. Lidgett, whatever the details of those circumstances may be, and that he returned inverted, just as a reflection returns from a mirror. From the last fact, as I have already stated, it follows almost inevitably that Plattner, during those nine days, must have been in some state of existence altogether out of space. The evidence to these statements is, indeed, far stronger than that upon which most murderers are hanged. But for his own particular account of where he had been, with its confused explanations and well-nigh self-contradictory details, we have only Mr. Gottfried Plattner's word. I do not wish to discredit that, but I must point out what so many writers upon obscure psychic phenomena fail to do, that we are passing here from the practically undeniable to that kind of matter which any reasonable man is entitled to believe or reject as he thinks proper. The previous statements render it plausible. Its discordance with common experience tilts it towards the incredible. I would prefer not to sway the beam of the reader's judgment either way, but simply to tell the story as Plattner told it to me. 
He gave me his narrative, I may state, at my house at Chislehurst, and so soon as he had left me that evening I went into my study and wrote down everything as I remembered it. Subsequently he was good enough to read over a typewritten copy, so that its substantial correctness is undeniable. He states that at the moment of explosion he distinctly thought he was killed. He felt lifted off his feet and driven forcibly backward. It is a curious fact for psychologists that he thought clearly during his backward flight, and wondered whether he should hit the chemistry cupboard or the blackboard easel. His heels struck ground, and he staggered and fell heavily into a sitting position on something soft and firm. For a moment the concussion stunned him. He became aware at once of a vivid scent of singed hair, and he seemed to hear the voice of Lydgate asking for him. You will understand that for a time his mind was greatly confused. At first he was under the impression that he was still standing in the classroom. He perceived quite distinctly the surprise of the boys and the entry of Mr. Lidgett. He is quite positive upon that score. He did not hear their remarks, but that he ascribed to the deafening effect of the experiment. Things about him seemed curiously dark and faint, but his mind explained that on the obvious but mistaken idea that the explosion had engendered a huge volume of dark smoke. Through the dimness the figures of Lidgett and the boys moved, as faint and silent as ghosts. Plattner's face still tingled with the stinging heat of the flash. He was, he says, all muddled. His first definite thoughts seemed to have been of his personal safety. He thought he was perhaps blinded and deafened. He felt his limbs and face in a gingerly manner. Then his perceptions grew clearer, and he was astonished to miss the old familiar desks and other schoolroom furniture about him. Only dim, uncertain gray shapes stood in the place of these. Then came a thing that made him shout aloud and awoke his stunned faculties to instant activity. Two of the boys, gesticulating, walked one after the other, clean, through him. Neither manifested the slightest consciousness of his presence. It is difficult to imagine the sensation he felt. They came against him, he says, with no more force than a wisp of mist. Plattner's first thought after that was that he was dead, having been brought up with thoroughly sound views in these matters. However, he was a little surprised to find his body still about him. His second conclusion was that he was not dead, but that the others were, that the explosion had destroyed the Sussexville Proprietary School and every soul in it except for himself. But that, too, was scarcely satisfactory. He was thrown back upon astonished observation. Everything about him was profoundly dark. At first it seemed to have an altogether ebony blackness. Overhead was a black firmament. The only touch of light in the scene was a faint greenish glow at the edge of the sky in one direction, which threw into prominence a horizon of undulating black hills. This, I say, was his impression at first. As his eye grew accustomed to the darkness, he began to distinguish a faint quality of differentiating greenish color in the circumambient night. Against this background the furniture and occupants of the classroom, it seemed, stood out like phosphorescent specters, faint and impalpable. He extended his hand and thrust it without an effort through the wall of the room by the fireplace. He describes himself as making a strenuous effort to attract attention. He shouted to Lidgett and tried to seize the boys as they went to and fro. He only desisted from these attempts when Mrs. Lidgett, whom he, as an assistant manager, naturally disliked, entered the room. He says the sensation of being in the world, and yet not a part of it, was an extraordinarily disagreeable one. He compared his feelings, not inaptly, to those of a cat watching a mouse through a window. Whenever he made a motion to communicate with the dim, familiar world about him, he found an invisible, incomprehensible barrier preventing intercourse. He then turned his attention to his solid environment. He found the medicine bottle still unbroken in his hand, with the remainder of the green powder therein. He put this in his pocket and began to feel about him. Apparently he was sitting on a boulder of rock covered with a velvety moss. The dark country about him he was unable to see, the faint, misty picture of the schoolroom blotting it out. But he had a feeling, due perhaps to a cold wind, that he was near the crest of a hill, and that a steep valley fell away beneath his feet. The green glow along the edge of the sky seemed to be growing in extent and intensity. He stood up, rubbing his eyes. 
It would seem that he made a few steps, going steeply downhill, and then stumbled, nearly fell, and sat down again upon a jagged mass of rock to watch the dawn. He became aware that the world about him was absolutely silent. It was as still as it was dark, and though there was a cold wind blowing up the hill face, the rustle of grass, the sowing of the boughs, that should have accompanied it, were absent. He could hear, therefore, if he could not see, that the hillside upon which he stood was rocky and desolate. The green grew brighter every moment, and as it did so a faint transparent blood-red mingled with, but did not mitigate the blackness of the sky overhead and the rocky desolations about him. Having regard to what follows, I am inclined to think that the redness may have been an optical effect due to contrast. Something black fluttered momentarily against the livid yellow-green of the lower sky, and then the thin and penetrating voice of a bell rose out of the black gulf below him. An oppressive expectation grew with the growing light. It is probable that an hour or more elapsed while he sat there, the strange green light growing brighter every moment, and spreading slowly in flamboyant fingers upward toward the zenith. As it grew, the spectral vision of our world became relatively or absolutely fainter, probably both, for the time must have been about that of our earthly sunset. So far as his vision of our world went, Platner, by his few steps downhill, had passed through the floor of the classroom and was now, it seemed, sitting in mid-air in the larger schoolroom downstairs. He saw the boarders distinctly, but much more faintly than he had seen Lidgett. They were preparing their evening tasks, and he noticed with interest that several were cheating with their Euclid riders by means of a crib, a compilation whose existence he had hitherto never expected. As the time passed they faded steadily, as steadily as the light of the green dawn increased. Looking down into the valley he saw that the light had crept far down its rocky sides, and that the profound blackness of the abyss was now broken by a minute green glow, like the light of a glowworm and almost immediately the limb of a huge heavenly body of blazing green rose over the basaltic undulations of the distant hills, and the monstrous hill-masses about him came out gaunt and desolate in green light and deep ruddy black shadows. He became aware of a vast number of ball-shaped objects, drifting as thistle-down drifts over the high ground. There were none of these nearer to him than the opposite side of the gorge. The bell below twanged quicker and quicker, with something like impatient insistence, and several lights moved hither and thither. The boys at work at their desks were now almost imperceptibly faint. This extinction of our world, when the green sun of this other universe rose, is a curious point upon which Platner insists. During the other world night it is difficult to move about, on account of the vividness with which the things of this world are visible. It becomes a riddle to explain why, if this is the case, we in this world catch no glimpse of the other world. It is due, perhaps, to the comparatively vivid illumination of this world of ours. Platner describes the midday of the other world at its brightest as not being nearly so bright as this world at full moon, while its night is profoundly black. Consequently, the amount of light, even in an ordinary dark room, is sufficient to render the things of the other world invisible, on the same principle that faint phosphorescence is only visible in the profoundest darkness. I have tried, since he told me his story, to see something of the other world by sitting for a long space in a photographer's dark room at night. I have certainly seen indistinctly the form of greenish slopes and rocks, but only, I must admit, very indistinctly indeed. The reader may possibly be more successful. Platner tells me that since his return he has dreamt and seen and recognized places in the other world, but this is probably due to his memory of these scenes. It seems quite possible that people with unusually keen eyesight may occasionally catch a glimpse of this strange other world about us. However, this is digression. As the green sun rose, a long street of black buildings became perceptible though only darkly and indistinctly in the gorge, and after some hesitation Platner began to clamber down the precipitous descent toward them. The descent was long and exceedingly tedious, being so not only by the extraordinary steepness, but also by reason of the looseness of the boulders with which the whole face of the hill was strewn. The noise of his descent, now and then his heels struck fire from the rocks, seemed now the only sound in the universe, for the beating of the bell had ceased. 
As he drew nearer he perceived that the various edifices had a singular resemblance to tombs and mausoleums and monuments, saving only that they were all uniformly black instead of being white as most sepulchres are. And then he saw, crowding out of the largest building, very much as people disperse from church, a number of pallid, rounded, pale green figures. These dispersed in several directions about the broad street of the place, some going through side alleys and reappearing upon the steepness of the hill, others entering some of the small black buildings which lined the way. At the sight of these things drifting up towards him, Plattner stopped staring. They were not walking. They were indeed limbless, and they had the appearance of human heads, beneath which a tadpole-like body swung. He was too astonished at their strangeness, too full, indeed, of strangeness, to be seriously alarmed by them. They drove towards him in front of the chill wind that was blowing uphill, much as soap-bubbles drive before a draft. And as he looked at the nearest of those approaching, he saw it was indeed a human head albeit with singularly large eyes, and wearing such an expression of distress and anguish as he had never seen before upon mortal countenance. He was surprised to find that it did not turn to regard him, but seemed to be watching and following some unseen moving thing. For a moment he was puzzled, and then it occurred to him that this creature was watching with its enormous eyes something that was happening in the world he had just left. Nearer it came, and nearer, and he was too astonished to cry out. It made a very faint fretting sound as it came close to him. Then it struck his face with a gentle pat, its touch was very cold, and drove past him and upward toward the crest of the hill. An extraordinary conviction flashed across Plattner's mind that this head had a strong likeness to Lidgett. Then he turned his attention to the other heads that were now swarming thickly up the hillside. None made the slightest sign of recognition. One or two, indeed, came close to his head and almost followed the example of the first, but he dodged convulsively out of the way. Upon most of them he saw the same expression of unavailing regret he had seen upon the first, and heard the same faint sounds of wretchedness from them. One or two wept, and one rolling swiftly uphill wore an expression of diabolical rage. But others were cold, and several had a look of gratified interest in their eyes. One, at least, was almost in an ecstasy of happiness. Plattner does not remember that he recognized any more likenesses in those he saw at this time. For several hours, perhaps, Plattner watched these strange things dispersing themselves over the hills, and not till long after they had ceased to issue from the clustering black buildings in the gorge did he resume his downward climb. The darkness about him increased so much that he had a difficulty in stepping true. Overhead the sky was now a bright pale green. He felt neither hunger nor thirst. Later, when he did, he found a chilly stream running down the center of the gorge, and the rare moss upon the boulders, when he tried it at last in desperation, was good to eat. He groped about among the tombs that ran down the gorge, seeking vaguely for some clue to these inexplicable things. After a long time he came to the entrance of the big mausoleum-like building from which the heads had issued. In this he found a group of green lights burning upon a kind of basaltic altar, and a bell-rope from a belfry overhead hanging down into the center of the place. Round the wall ran a lettering of fire in a character unknown to him. While he was still wondering at the purport of these things, he heard the receding tramp of heavy feet echoing far down the street. He ran out into the darkness again, but he could see nothing. He had a mind to pull the bell-rope, and finally decided to follow the footsteps. But although he ran far, he never overtook them, and his shouting was of no avail. The gorge seemed to extend an interminable distance. It was as dark as earthly starlight throughout its length, while the ghastly green day lay along the upper edge of its precipices. There were none of the heads now, below. They were all, it seemed, busily occupied along the upper slopes. Looking up, he saw them drifting hither and thither, some hovering stationary, some flying swiftly through the air. It reminded him, he said, of big snowflakes, only these were black and pale green. In pursuing the firm, undeviating footsteps that he never overtook, in groping into new regions of this endless devil's dyke, in clambering up and down the pitiless heights, in wandering about the summits, and in watching the drifting faces, Plattner states that he spent the better part of seven or eight days. He did not keep count, he says, 
Though once or twice he found eyes watching him, he had word with no living soul. He slept among the rocks on the hillside. In the gorge things earthly were invisible, because from the earthly standpoint it was far underground. On the altitudes, so soon as the earthly day began, the world became visible to him. He found himself sometimes stumbling over the dark green rocks, or arresting himself on a precipitous brink, while all about him the green branches of the Sussexville lanes were swaying, or again he seemed to be walking through the Sussexville streets or watching unseen the private business of some household. And then it was, he discovered, that to almost every human being in our world there pertained some of these drifting heads that everyone in the world is watched intermittently by these helpless disembodiments. What are they? These watchers of the living? Plattner never learned. But two that presently found and followed him were like his childhood's memory of his father and mother. Now and then other faces turned their eyes upon him, eyes like those of dead people who had swayed him or injured him or helped him in his youth and manhood. Whenever they looked at him, Plattner was overcome with a strange sense of responsibility. To his mother he ventured to speak, but she made no answer. She looked sadly, steadfastly, and tenderly, a little reproachfully, too, it seemed, into his eyes. He simply tells this story. He does not endeavor to explain. We are left to surmise who these watchers of the living may be, or if they are indeed the dead, why they should so closely and passionately watch a world they have left forever. It may be, indeed to my mind it seems just, that when our life has closed, when evil or good is no longer a choice for us, we may still have to witness the working out of the train of consequences we have laid. If human souls continue after death, then surely human interests continue after death. But that is merely my own guess at the meaning of the things seen. Plattner offers no interpretation, for none was given him. It is well the reader should understand this clearly. Day after day, with his head reeling, he wandered about this strange-lit world outside the world, weary and, towards the end, weak and hungry. By day, by our earthly day, that is, the ghostly vision of the old familiar scenery of Sussexville all about him irked and worried him. He could not see where to put his feet, and ever and again with a chilly touch one of these watching souls would come against his face. And after dark the multitude of these watchers about him and their intent distress confused his mind beyond describing. A great longing to return to the earthly life that was so near and yet so remote consumed him. The unearthliness of things about him produced a positively painful mental distress. He was worried beyond describing by his own particular followers. He would shout at them to desist from staring at him, scold at them, hurry away from them. They were always mute and intent. Run as he might over the uneven ground, they followed his destinies. On the ninth day, towards evening, Plattner heard the invisible footsteps approaching, far away down the gorge. He was then wandering over the broad crest of the same hill upon which he had fallen in his entry into this strange other world of his. He turned to hurry down into the gorge, feeling his way hastily, and was arrested by the sight of the thing that was happening in a room in a back street near the school. Both of the people in the room he knew by sight. The windows were open, the blinds up, and the setting sun shone clearly into it, so that it came out quite brightly at first, a vivid oblong room lying like a magic lantern picture upon the black landscape and the livid green dawn. In addition to the sunlight a candle had just been lit in the room. On the bed lay a lank man, his ghastly white face terrible upon the tumbled pillow. His clenched hands were raised above his head. A little table beside the bed carried a few medicine bottles, some toast and water and an empty glass. Every now and then the lank man's lips fell apart to indicate a word he could not articulate. But the woman did not notice that he wanted anything, because she was busy turning out papers from an old-fashioned bureau in the opposite corner of the room. At first the picture was very vivid indeed, but as the green dawn behind it grew brighter and brighter so it became fainter and more and more transparent. As the echoing footsteps paced nearer and nearer, those footsteps that sound so loud in that other world and come so silently in this, Plattner perceived about him a great multitude of dim faces gathering together out of the darkness and watching the two people in the room. Never before had he seen so many of the watchers of the living. A multitude had eyes only for the sufferer in the room, 
Another multitude, in infinite anguish, watched the woman as she hunted with greedy eyes for something she could not find. They crowded about Platner. They came across his sight and buffeted his face. The noise of their unavailing regrets was all about him. He saw clearly only now and then. At other times the picture quivered dimly, through the veil of green reflections upon their movements. In the room it must have been very still, and Platner says the candle flame streamed up into a perfectly vertical line of smoke. But in his ears each footfall and its echoes beat like a clap of thunder. And the faces, two more particularly near the woman's, one a woman's also, white and clear-featured, a face which might have once been cold and hard, but which was now softened by the touch of a wisdom strange to earth. The other might have been the woman's father. Both were evidently absorbed in the contemplation of some act of hateful meanness, so it seemed, which they could no longer guard against and prevent. Behind were others, teachers, it may be, who had taught ill, friends whose influence had failed, and over the man, too, a multitude, but none that seemed to be parents or teachers, faces that might once have been coarse, now purged to strength by sorrow and in the forefront one face, a girlish one, neither angry nor remorseful, but merely patient and weary, and, as it seemed to Platner, waiting for relief. His powers of description fail him at the memory of this multitude of ghastly countenances. They gathered on the stroke of the bell. He saw them all in the space of a second. It would seem that he was so worked on by his excitement that quite involuntarily his restless fingers took the bottle of green powder out of his pocket and held it before him. But he does not remember that. Abruptly the footsteps ceased. He waited for the next, and there was silence. And then, suddenly, cutting through the unexpected stillness like a keen, thin blade, came the first stroke of the bell. At that the multitudinous faces swayed to and fro, and a louder crying began all about him. The woman did not hear. She was burning something now in the candle flame. At the second stroke everything grew dim, and a breath of wind, icy cold, blew through the host of watchers. They swirled about him like an eddy of dead leaves in the spring, and at the third stroke something was extended through them to the bed. You have heard of a beam of light? This was like a beam of darkness, and looking again at it Platner saw that it was a shadowy arm and hand. The green sun was now topping the black desolations of the horizon, and the vision of the room was very faint. Platner could see that the white of the bed struggled and was convulsed, and that the woman looked around over her shoulder at it, startled. The cloud of watchers lifted high like a puff of green dust before the wind, and swept silently downward toward the temple in the gorge. Then suddenly Platner understood the meaning of the shadowy black arm that stretched across his shoulder and clutched its prey. He did not dare turn his head to see the shadow behind the arm. With a violent effort and covering his eyes he set himself to run, made perhaps twenty strides, then slipped on a boulder and fell. He fell forward on his hands, and the bottle smashed and exploded as he touched the ground. In another moment he found himself stunned and bleeding, sitting face to face with Lidgett in the old walled garden behind the school. There the story of Platner's experience ends. I have resisted, I believe successfully, the natural disposition of a writer of fiction to dress up incidents of this sort. I have told the thing as far as possible in the order in which Platner told it to me. I have carefully avoided any attempt at style, effect, or construction. It would have been easy, for instance, to have worked the scene of the deathbed into a kind of plot in which Platner might have been involved. But quite apart from the objectionableness of falsifying a most extraordinary true story, any such trite device would spoil, to my mind, the peculiar effect of this dark world, with its livid green illumination and its drifting watchers of the living, which, unseen and unapproachable to us, is yet lying all about us. It remains to add that a death did actually occur in Vincent Terrace just beyond the school garden, and so far as can be proved at the moment of Platner's return. Deceased was a rate collector and insurance agent. His widow, who was much younger than himself, married last month a Mr. Wymper, a veterinary surgeon of all bleeding. As the portion of this story given here has in various forms circulated orally in Sussexville, she has consented to my use of her name, on condition that I make it distinctly known that she emphatically contradicts every detail of Platner's account of her husband's last moments. She burnt no will, she says, although Platner never accused her of doing so. 
Her husband made but one will, and that just after their marriage. Certainly from a man who had never seen it, Plattner's account of the furniture of the room was curiously accurate. One other thing, even at the risk of an irksome repetition, I must insist upon, lest I seem to favor the credulous superstitious view. Plattner's absence from the world for nine days is, I think, proved, but that does not prove his story. It is quite conceivable that even outside space hallucinations may be possible. That, at least, the reader must bear distinctly in mind. End of The Plattner Story by H. G. Wells